We started a, a New Year's resolution series a couple weeks ago um, with really the desire to become all that God desires us to be, right? To become all that, that we should be in Christ. And, and that's a great goal, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's easy enough. Just kind of choose to follow Jesus and, and just start acting the way you're supposed to be acting. And, um, but it's certainly easier said than done. Right? I mean, at least that's been my experience. Um, some of those things um, in my life that they're a little harder to, to fix than others, right? You see, much, much like ogres, humans have layers. And not all of our layers are cake, right? Some of them are pretty stinky. Um, speaking about myself, not speaking about you. By the way, I just want to mention, um, you guys don't get to see this perspective, but you guys look way better in bluish gray than you do in orange, just, <laughs> just, just so you know. That was just a side comment. comment. <clears throat> now, as we've been talking about, we live in a fallen world where we don't get all of our needs fully met, and that's mostly because we have this broken relationship with God, right? Um, we end up trying to get all of our needs met by by other means, most often um, other human beings who have the same issues as we do, and, and we end up damaging each other. And, um, you know, those thoughts, those desires, those emotions that we experience as we're going through these painful times, they inform us and how we work through life. And similar to medicine, we get from doctors for, for physical pain. I mean, just thinking through the different types of, of pain medicine that, I've, uh, that I'm familiar with, some of them, you know, are kind of like the anti-inflammatory pain medicine where it actually helps you heal. And some of that pain medicine out there is, is just there to simply give you pain relief. It's there to cover over the pain, right? Um... And I don't think I have to explain this fully. I get to go to a lot of surgeries, but um, when you take too much of that pain medicine, other things happen to your body, right? Some things that are not so good. Um, some things get kind of clogged up and things like that. So, um, so sometimes when we, we do that covering up of pain stuff, we end up with some of our own layers, right? Some things that maybe we don't even know is there. In fact, some of my layers I discovered is one of my grandfather's layer, right? Something that he chose to do, and he passed it on to my mom, who passed it on to me. Sometimes it might be your grand, grand, great grandma, right? Um, I guess I said that wrong. Great, great grandmother. There we go. Wendy's always trying to correct me. And I could hear her mentally. Um, <laughs> And I appreciate it before I get myself in trouble there. Anyway, sometimes the layers aren't even ours. We just kind of inherited them, right? What do we do with those? And we've really spent the last couple of weeks finding ways to explore these layers, discover what's underneath, um, what problems, what emotions that we're actually struggling with. Sometimes we see stuff on the surface that's not really the stuff that we're struggling with, just happens to be the stuff, I mean, the anger conversation that we had last week. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff. In fact, I don't know about you, but as I was starting to feel frustrated at times this week, did you think through and, and process, well, where is that actually coming from? That happened to me a couple times ago why am I feeling angry right now? Why am I feeling frustrated? What, what's going on in my life? But, uh, and really, we can ignore this stuff, but it's still there. It's real. Um, it's part of our experience here on this planet, and it really is a good reason why we should be patient with each other, right? I mean, we don't know what anyone else in this room, we know each other, but we don't know each other deeply to the point where we would understand why you struggle with what you struggle with or why I struggle with what I struggle with. We really should give us, give each other plenty of grace as we work through this together, right, as a church family. Um, and really these BC experiences that I sometimes call them, the experiences that we get before we met Christ, right? Um, those 
those responses that we have to these difficult, painful experiences, they create BC habits, our old ways, before we met Christ. Even some of our ways that maybe we inherited while we were in Christ, not wanting to do that, but we get there. And some of these habits, they have a tendency to stick with us way more than we'd like them to, right? They're just hard to get rid of. I mean, if you really think about the Christian life and what we're expecting to see happen, we're going from a place of building our lives around ourself, self-protection, self-building ourselves up, to a place where we actually could love someone else, where we might actually be um, willing to offer our heart to other people. And these are people that might damage us, right? I mean, how in the world does Jesus want us to get to loving our neighbor? Have you met my neighbor? <laughs> actually, you, you probably know my neighbor. <laughs> He's right over there. And they're good people. They're good people. But... I'm digging lots of holes this morning. Um, and, and really, we really can't sell too short, right, what has happened to us in Christ. I mean, yes, the past is powerful, but when we met Christ, when we invited him to be a part of our lives, when we invited him to be Savior of our life, something big did happen. Something huge happened, right? Something, you know, remember, before we received Christ. His gift of salvation, the Bible says that we were dead. We were dead in our transgressions. Dead. But when we received Christ's gift for us, God made us alive together in Christ. Made us alive. Ephesians 2, verse 1, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, right? When you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. This is what we've been talking about, right? Like the rest, we were by nature deserving, deserving of wrath. But, and this is a big but, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace, it's a gift of God that you have been saved. And at that moment that we received salvation, right, we were justified by his grace. Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the gift, into the grace in which we now stand. Praise the Lord. We have the garden relationship with God, right? We have that back. When God looks at me, when God looks at you in Christ, it's just as if you'd never sinned. Justified. We ask for forgiveness, and, and God gives it to us. It's a done deal. God doesn't hold grudges. The past is the past. It's gone right? You and God, you're good. <laughs> In that moment, we have peace with God. Through Christ, God is back in our lives. You are a child of God. In his eyes, he sees you as perfect in Christ. That's your new identity. That's your true self. That's who you are. Your sins are forgiven. You have new life. You are now alive in Christ. It happens in a moment, doesn't it? When we receive that salvation. But it's just the beginning. Just the beginning. I mean, God doesn't just zap you with his ray gun and say, hey, you're good. On to the next person. <laughs> no, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a relationship, as we call it. It, it can take some time for us to, to kind of grasp what in the world he's just done to us, right? To catch up with what Jesus did, to embrace this new reality of who we are in Christ, to really start living into who we now are. I mean, that's a major shift. 
And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge, to admit that change is hard. Change is hard. No matter what the change is. I don't care what you're trying to change. Change is hard, especially this kind of change. And really, all you have to do is go back and look at the children of Israel to see how hard change is, right? Imagine seeing God do some unbelievable things like he did through the plagues. And he found some way to free his people, the Israelites, if you're one of them, from slavery, from oppression to the Egyptians. And not only does he send you off free, he, he actually lets you plunder them. They give you all the gold, all the riches that they were able to walk out with. I mean, it's just unbelievable to see how God worked in that story, right? In their lives. I mean, how excited would you be if you were an Israelite at that time period, seeing all that God was doing? But in a few short days after this incredible deliverance, where are the Israelites? They're wishing they could go back to Egypt. They want to go back into slavery. They want to go back. <laughs> what? How does that happen? Well, we like to be comfortable, even when that comfortable is not, <laughs> not even good. We just don't like change. Oh, I'm good. I'll just stay right here being slaves, oppressed. I mean, that's unbelievable. As Joel Mom says in his book, that the children of Israel were out of Egypt, but it took 40 years in the desert to get Egypt out of them. It took some time, didn't it? We're all in that same process. We're all in that same journey. We're trying to get rid of the old ways, and we're trying to put on our new ways in Christ, right? Change is hard. But you say, Pastor, you, you don't understand. Well, the Israelites, they were under the old covenant. They had a different type of relationship. They didn't have the spirit yet, and we're different. We're under the new covenant. We, we, we have the spirit of God. We're different than these Israelites. God transforms us instantly. In fact, some of you might be thinking, well, isn't that what the, the doctrine of entire sanctification is about? I mean, isn't, that, isn't that why we have that? I know some of you aren't thinking that. <laughs> There might be a few here, though, that are thinking that. I mean, isn't that what we're talking about? Well, it's interesting when you, when you think about change. You remember the words of, of Paul, Romans chapter 7. Have you read them lately? Verse 15 says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. <laughs> Sound familiar to any of you? And this is Paul. This is Mr. Super Saint Paul, right? And he's struggling with change. And this is in the New Covenant, right? This is after the Spirit came. And then on in verse 21, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Ah, just imagine I'm calling up Paul, right? This is the Paul. I mean, Paul. Hold on here, Paul. I was just reading your letter. And I, I think you need to work on your words a little bit because you're really not a wretched person, right? You need to be nicer to yourself. And I know you're the apostle and everything, but... You're just a little confused. <laughs> you, uh, you know, the, the Spirit, He wants to transform us. And all you have to do is ask. That's right, yeah. You don't have to go into the desert like the Israelites did anymore. You don't have to go there. You can just ask, and He'll do it. What did you say? You said Jesus went to the desert? Well, why did He go to the desert? That doesn't make any sense. Fasting for 40 days, that, that almost sounds like struggle. What? Okay, well, I think you have me there, Paul. <laughs> Old covenant, new covenant. 
It's all the same. We struggle with change. Change is hard. The struggle is real. And it's also biblical. And if you ask my opinion, which none of you are, <laughs> if you ask my opinion about why we struggle so much, I think really the Israelites give us a really good answer. If you read the story, you will see before they cried out to God for help, they spent years not including God in their life. Not even thinking about him. They'd forgotten him. They'd lived life without him for years. Much like our before Christ moments, right? They're so ingrained, this life separated from God. It takes time to include God in our lives, doesn't it? You can't just go from never thinking about God to including him in every part of your life. It just doesn't work that way. It takes time. It takes discipline. We have to discipline ourselves to go to him with problems. In order to move forward, we actually have to be intentional, very intentional about embracing this new identity that we have in Christ. Trusting in him. Or else we'll just slip back right into where we were before. Because you know what? That's comfortable and that's way easier. I mean, it's a mess, but it's my mess. A life not with God. What we're used to. And that really leads us into the second truth about change. Remember Paul's question? Who will rescue me? <laughs> it's a great question. And the truth is that real lasting change it starts with God. That's where it comes from. Remember that God is the one who perfectly fulfills our needs. That's an important concept. <laughs> He's the one that's designed us to need him. If we're going to fulfill all of our needs, if we're going to be all that we want to be in him, all that he wants us to be, if we want to find healing for our BC ways, before Christ ways, who's going to do that for us? God, right? Who do we, who are we used to going to with our problems? Me. That's where I go to for problems. Before Christ, right? Why do you think that God gave the Israelites a daily dose of manna? <laughs> not a week's worth, not, you know, a month's worth. He gave them a daily dose of manna every day. What was he teaching them? Dependence. Trust. Remember me, <laughs> right? Remember me. And it wasn't just, you know, every once in a while. It wasn't a one-time thing. It was every day. Depending on the Lord to supply for my needs. Change is hard. How quickly do we want to just start doing it our way again? My life's a mess. <laughs> but again, it's, it's, it's my mess. I'm comfortable with that. Pretty used to that. And yes, we do have the Spirit in our lives, right? We have the Spirit, according to Scripture, from the moment that we receive salvation. He's in our lives. This new life in Christ. But what good is the Spirit when we haven't learned to actually depend on Him? To include Him in our lives, right? He's in our life, but we're not including Him. You know what I think entire sanctification is? It's not when we are completely repaired on the outside and doing everything perfectly. I don't think that's it. I actually think entire sanctification is we finally get to the point where we figure out that we finally... We, we ultimately still need God. <laughs> I've prayed to receive Christ. I've been saved. And you know what? He's not done with me yet. I still need him. We finally figure out that he's not just there to get us this golden ticket to heaven. As the old song goes, <laughs> we need thee every hour. We need you, God. God. We finally get to that point where we surrender 
to being fully dependent on God. That's what I would call my moment of entire sanctification. The power to change my life, it was in my life before, right? But I was trying to do it on my own before. I hadn't fully depend on, depended on him. And I can't do it on my own. I tried. Listen to Paul again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who sanctifies us? We don't even do that part, right? God sanctifies us. Who sets us apart for God's use? It's him. Who helps us become all that we were designed to be? God himself, the God of peace through his Holy Spirit. We'll never get there with our normal approach to things. It's our, it's our, it's our New Year's resolution approach to our problems, right? Our resolve to change my behavior. <laughs> I'm going to will this done. I'm going to fight my way through this. Well, good luck with that. You know what? I've tried to exercise more. <laughs> at New Year's resolution time, right? And I can't even do that, much less some of the other stuff we're talking about here. I'm just going to get more frustrated than I was to begin with. God does the work. God does the work. And he just doesn't just work on the outside, does he? According to this verse, it's through and through, spirit, soul, and body. Real lasting change starts with God, but it also starts on the inside. Truth number three. Don't you just love those TV shows where you know, they're re remodeling houses and trying to fix things up and taking some old beat up house and making it into something beautiful. But when it comes to people, changing the outside isn't enough. We see all of our celebrities that look really good <laughs> And they are a mess. It's way more important, actually, to work on our inside than our outside. Where do we usually start when we start a remodeling project of ourselves? The outside, don't we? Don't we always start with the bad behavior? You remember Jesus' complaints about the, the Pharisees in Mark 7? He says, are you so dull don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them, for it doesn't go into their heart? It goes into their stomach, then out of the body. He went on, what, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come from. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from the inside and defile a person. Found an interesting quote by Richard Foster. He said, superficiality, only working on the surface, only working on the outside, is the curse of our age. It's an interesting statement. It's the curse of our age. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people or even beautiful people all out in there, but for deep people. We've got to be willing to go deeper, to go to the root of the problem, to go to the inside. And if we really want change in our lives, we can't just change the environment. It's not just enough to change the place that you go to or change your computers and put internet filters on them. It it's, might be a great start to the project, but, but if we want real lasting change, it's got to start from the inside out. The real problem, the deeper problem, isn't found in our behavior. It's found in our heart. We need a heart change. External controls to avoid sin or to avoid our old ways of life they can help to some degree, but not enough. What we need is some internal controls, and that comes through allowing the, whole, the Spirit of God 
free reign in our lives to do his work. Real change starts inside. So there you go. Three points. Change is hard. <laughs> real lasting change starts with God. And real lasting change starts on the inside. If I were a three-point type sermon preacher, you guys would be done. <laughs> I'm not very good at three-point sermons. Sorry, Pastor Stan. So let's just work on some application. So I'm trying to grow in the Lord, trying to grow in my relationship. And, and if all of this is true, if, if change really is hard and there's, it's not something that I can do on my own, if real change is really the Spirit's work working on me and in me, how do I live into this? How do I, how do I better cooperate with the Spirit so that He can do His thing and, and, and transform my life? I mean, this is an important topic, isn't it? We do have a part to play in this. It's not just, hey, God, go do it. I'll sit here and drink a Coke. There are some principles at work here. And think through this. When, we, when we're trying to grow uh, stronger physically, there's, there's a certain process to it, right? We, we have to discipline ourselves. We have to start working out. We've got to start watching what we eat. There's just some steps to the process to grow stronger physically. Um, and then think about it. It doesn't happen overnight. How long does it take to start seeing some things happen if you're trying to grow physically stronger? It takes a while sometimes, right? But eventually, if you stay disciplined, you keep working through it, something happens. At least that's what they tell me. And the same is true when we're growing spiritually. It's a slow process of stretching, stretching ourselves, stretching our faith, being intentional about <clears throat> what we're doing, being intentional about who we are trusting. And I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about me versus God. Um, when you run across shame-based um, behaviors and emotions and thoughts, I mean, as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, Surrendering those to God, really taking the time to think about those things and process through those things. You might even have to pay attention to what you're putting into your soul, right? What are you consuming? Not, not physically, but, you know, what are you watching? What are you involved in? Surrendering daily to his ways, his thoughts, uh, listening intently to his nudges, the Spirit's nudges in our life, responding to those things. You know, he has a still, small voice. It takes time set aside, getting quiet and listening to what he's doing in our lives. You might even start pushing yourself into some spiritual disciplines. In fact, let me just add one more truth, which makes it a four-point sermon. But um, spiritual disciplines are the key to lasting change. What are spiritual disciplines? Well, spiritual disciplines are exercises that actually help us prepare ourselves for God's transforming work in our lives. They help us cooperate with Him. They help us allow Him to work on us. They strengthen us as we walk in Christ. Um, spiritual disciplines that we most often talk about are, are, I know you have a few popping into your head, the um, devotional reading of the Bible, right? We're reading scripture, um, hopefully often, daily, and we're just allowing God to speak into our lives. Um, that's a great, great um, place to start. Prayer, obviously, is tied to that, speaking to God and listening to what he has to say. Worship, you know, taking time to make sure that, that he is my most important thing in my life. Um, tithing, trusting him with the resources that he's given me, uh, fasting. There's just lots of spiritual disciplines. They might even be just simply looking at spiritual goals that you find in Scripture and just thinking about them often. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is one that I, I think about a lot, the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, wouldn't it be a good discipline to to think through what those spirit, those fruits are that should be coming out of my life and, 
and looking at what it actually is coming out of my life and going through that process of why, why am I not seeing the fruit that I want to see? <laughs> God, can you do something in my life? What do I need to do to fix this problem? What, what do you, how can I cooperate with you, right? It's just an example. And si similar to physical discipline and when working out is we work out um, with spiritual disciplines. If we allow God to discipline us through our disciplines, um, we slowly but surely start noticing some difference in our lives. As we continue to put ourselves at the feet of Jesus, as we surrender to his thoughts, his ways, especially when we see our ways trying to creep back into our lives, we, 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 he starts doing something in us. We start noticing, man, I, I used to get angry at that, and I don't, for some reason, I'm not feeling angry right now. And it's not because I willed it done. God's doing something in my life, right? You realize one day that you don't have to force yourself to have compassion on other people. I actually care. It's almost the moment of um, the Grinch. Oh, my heart. What is happening here? It's not because we chose to care about other people. God's doing something in our lives. Uh, you don't want to lust anymore. You don't want to fear anymore. You want to start doing the things that he wants in our lives. And as, as we continue to work to trust him more, we're allowing God to be God more and more. And we see in our lives the signs that we're becoming more and more like Jesus as his spirit leads. I mean, our hearts are changing. For real. So where, where should we start? Well, I think it would be very appropriate for us to start with a prayer. And it would be a prayer like, God, I'm tired of trying to follow you in my own strength. Tired of it. <laughs> tired of relying on myself to fix myself. I, I want to surrender to your will in my life. And I don't know what that looks like or how to even get that done, but whatever you want for me, you can have it. And would you help me to do it? Will you help me? Would you be willing to pray a prayer like that? And then maybe you start dabbling in spiritual disciplines. Find, you know, each day grab a Bible and, and start Maybe thumbing through there. Find the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, somewhere like that. Start reading through just a little bit, a section, maybe a day. Start thinking through that and asking God to speak to you through it. and Pray to him. Maybe start with the prayer that we just talked about. You know what? I really can't do this on my own. You're going to have to work in me to get this done. Would you just speak to me and challenge me this day? I only got a day to give you. <laughs> One day at a time. Find a friend to encourage you in this process. I mean, we are in a church family for a reason. It's not because of your great food at potlucks, though that is a positive. We're, we're here for each other, right? Encouraging each other. Keep going. Can we do this? Slowly but surely, maybe you try some other spiritual disciplines. Commit to being a part of your church family. Well, what I just mentioned. Make it a habit to be here on Sunday. A habit. Discipline yourself. It's a discipline, isn't it? You've got to choose this over something else. That's discipline. It's, it's, it's letting God be first. Not letting other things get in the way. Look for a small group. Get involved. And if you come back next week, <laughs> we're going to be looking through three other spiritual disciplines, one week at a time, to kind of address the problems that we started talking about the last couple of weeks, looking at the hurt triangle. And, and if you're willing to practice spiritual disciplines, God desires you to discipline yourself in spiritual things. And he will bring you strength. And he will bring you more freedom in Christ as we allow him to work in our lives. 
So let's just start with the prayer.